I thank Lynn for his invitation to preach at the Eucharist this morning. And I bring to you the greetings from the Cathedral of the Holy Cross in Lusaka, in the Church of Zambia in Central Africa, where I have worked as a priest and as a bishop, and also in Southern Africa for the past 47 years. I'm very happy to be visiting my sister Elizabeth and Derry Gordon, her husband, who are here in our church this morning with their son John and their family after an absence of seven years, and I returned to Lusaka at the end of this year. In the four Gospels, there is only one African who is mentioned, and I wonder if you know who that person is. The one African in the Gospels is, Cyre is Simon of Cyrene, the one who carried the cross of our Lord. And indeed, we may think of Africa as a continent carrying the cross of suffering through the past centuries, the cross of slavery, colonial oppression, economic exploitation by the multinationals, and most recently, the HIV-AIDS pandemic. And Africa is also the continent where the Christian church is growing the fastest of any other place in the world today. And there are a number of reasons for this, and one is demographic. African countries generally have a high birth rate, and the greater part of the population is young people. And so you will find in many congregations many young people, perhaps three choirs and a very large Sunday school. And also, African, traditional African religion encourages the belief in God as the Creator who is approached through the ancestors, and prayer comes to people very naturally. When I travel on the long bus journey from Kitwe to Lusaka, maybe for six hours, we always start from the terminus in Kitwe with someone preaching us a sermon, encouraging us to faith and repentance and conversion and also then praying for traveling mercies. And very often on the bus you will find people reading their Bibles or some other religious tract. And another reason for the growth of the church is the attraction of the gospel for those who are very poor. Most people are living on less than $2 a day. I notice in our hymn we've just had the, this phrase, give me tears instead of breakfast. And many people have the tears and never any breakfast because they have simply one meal a day. In the rural areas, people are subsistence farmers, susceptible to climate change and the fluctuation of crop prices. In the cities, people are very poor, mostly working as marketeers, selling little piles of tomatoes or onions or other vegetables, and second-hand clothing. Generally, people have to struggle for their survival. And the Christian gospel gives the message of our Lord's love for the poor as the person for others. It is the message that the, that the poor are those who are blessed, that good triumphs over evil, Life triumphs over death, and this gives hope for daily living and hope for the future. And again, every congregation is a family where church members give each other mutual support. Women's groups are especially strong, meeting every week for Bible study and fellowship, visiting the sick and the lapsed, and helping especially at the time of funerals. We have the youth groups, the choirs, and the praise teams. And also every congregation has small Christian communities meeting in people's homes in their different localities for Bible study and fellowship and outreach meeting once a week. And it may happen that a small Christian community becomes very large and becomes eventually a congregation in its own right. And so we see the church growing very fast. 
In my new rural diocese of eastern Zambia, we started in 1995 with seven parishes and 80 congregations. And today, 17 years later, there are 14 parishes and 115 congregations. We are also a church which is called to service. In today's gospel, we hear our Lord's words to the apostles about ambition. Ambition is right and good if it is not ambition for self-glory, to dominate over others, but rather ambition to serve. In our church in Central Africa, our purpose is for mission and service which is holistic, to serve the whole person in body, mind, and spirit. And so that we, in our worship, enjoy the Catholic tradition of the church, just like St. Matthew's in the city, with the ordered worship and emphasis on the Bible and the sacraments. We also need to help people's physical lives in very, very basic ways. And so we work for boreholes in all parish centers where people may find clean water. We also try to provide hammer mills in parish centers where women may grind their maize without long hours of pounding maize with a wooden pestle and mortar. And of course, the church is very active in addressing the HIV AIDS pandemic, which is greatest in Central and Southern Africa in Botswana as high as over 30%, high also in South Africa and also in our own area further north. Our women help with home-based care in rural villages and in the city compounds. Youth groups put on drama in the schools and community centers to convey the message of A, B, C. A for abstinence from sex, B from being faithful to one partner, and C, the use of condoms. And the pandemic, as you know, has tragically resulted in many orphans, and church organizations help with education and with supporting orphans and extended families where they are adopted by maybe an uncle or an aunt or other family relations looking after Instead of three children, maybe five or six children, looking after this increased family with great love and care. And many congregations have circles of hope. And these are people, both women and men, who are courageously open about their HIV AIDS infection. I say courageously because HIV AIDS is generally coming from sexual contact, and therefore there was a stigma surrounding the disease. And these circles of hope teach people how HIV AIDS can be avoided and how people can live positively and fulfilled lives who have the virus. And people in our country are very fortunate because the ARVs, the antiretroviral drugs are free because of help from the United States government and from the United Nations. And so today we find people coming for testing in large numbers. And if the drugs are taken daily all of one's life with adequate nutrition, people can live indefinitely. And so today the good news is that HIV AIDS infection is not the death sentence that it once used to be. And we find the infection rate coming down. Years back it was over 20%, today coming down to 16%. In Uganda, as low as 5%. And our Anglican Church is also foremost among, foremost among all the other churches in Zambia in combating the scourge of malaria by distributing nets for life. And this we are doing through the help of the Episcopal Leaf and Development of the Church of North America. 
and nets for life are long-lasting impregnated mosquito nets. And we find that through their use it's produced a tremendous decline in the deaths through malaria, especially among babies and young children. Our Christian service concerns both local and national issues, like good governance and the fight against corruption. And I'm very glad that this congregation has had met very varied issues of justice in the past. I remember preaching here in 1981 when I was on a tour for Heart, Hold All Races Tours. And the New Zealand Rugby Union was having meeting the Springboks from South Africa. And many New Zealanders were trying to fight the apartheid state through a sports, sports, sports boycott, just like members here in this congregation. And it's been my privilege to be involved for many years in the liberation struggle against the apartheid state of South Africa as a priest of the Anglican Church. For 15 years, I was a rural priest in Lesotho, a little independent kingdom in the mountains of South Africa, looking after, first of all, three parishes and 21 congregations, then later another place, one parish with eight congregations, all my work being on horseback because of the few roads in the mountains. And I moved from Lesotho to Botswana, to the Kalahari, again looking after many congregations in the heat of the Kalahari Desert, and then from there to Zambia, where I am still today. And when I was in Lesotho in 1976, we saw hundreds of youth from South Africa flooding into Lesotho to protest and organize against the violence of the South African state, which was then further limiting youth education, making it second class to compulsory education in the language of Afrikaans. And so I helped those youth to attend school, to find work, and especially to organize as members of the African National Congress, the Southern African Liberation Movement. And the purpose of those young people was to fight for an entirely different South Africa, based on the Freedom Charter, which called for a free democratic state which was non-racist, egalitarian, in which the government should be responsible to all the people, just like here in New Zealand. And my activity with the exiles led to two attacks on my life. The first was in 1979 by a parcel bomb which was sent to kill me by the South African security. That bomb fortunately didn't kill the six people in the room where we were, but it took off my right hand and the front part of my legs. And that attack showed that what I was doing was important, important enough to be killed for it, and therefore I should be all the more active, all the more focused in that same work. And that attempt on my life, by the grace of God, left the, led the African National Congress to establish the Interfaith Chaplaincy, which was a chaplaincy of church members and members of other faiths within the African National Congress itself, helping comrades with worship and welfare, and with the support of faith communities both inside and outside South Africa. I eventually moved to Botswana in the West, and nine years later, the South African security made a second attempt on my life by sending a death squad, which was fortunately known by the Botswana security, and I left Botswana at a few hours' notice. I moved to Zambia, where I was the chaplain of the African National Congress in Lusaka, for four years, ministering to 3,000 South African cadres who were the government in waiting for the free democratic South Africa that South the people are enjoying today. 
And when South Africans returned to their homes, I decided to remain in Zambia to help in the church, first as training chaplain, then I was elected the first bishop of the Eastern Diocese. And today my work is with refugees, mostly coming from Rwanda, who very sadly lose their refugee status in nine months' time. I know that here in St. Matthew's in the city, people are addressing important issues of human rights, especially of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered persons. Three Sundays ago, I was preaching in the Cathedral of Asheville in the United States, in North Carolina, where church members are involved in exactly the same issues. In Africa, you will find that generally, same-sex relations are very seldom discussed. I think this is because people's prime attention is on simply the purpose of survival, issues to eliminate poverty, to ensure good governance, that state resources are used where they are most needed, and also the fight against corruption. An African culture places great emphasis on marriage and on the birth of children and families put great pressure on their children to get married. And past colonial governments brought in the English common law which criminalized same-sex activity, and those same laws remain in place still today. But a striking exception is South Africa, where discrimination by race, religion, gender, and also sexual preference has made a criminal offence under the very, very good New South African Constitution. You will know perhaps about the controversy in the Anglican Communion brought by the consecration in New Hampshire, United States of Gene Robinson as a gay bishop living with a partner in 2002. And this caused part of the African church to distance itself from the American church, especially the African church in East and West Africa, but not ourselves in Central and Southern Africa. And the breakaway traditional Af Anglican church in the United States has promoted this division because it favors their own narrow interests. And so when I attended the Lambeth Conference in 2009, there were 800 bishops invited and 200 bishops simply stayed away, mostly coming from Africa. The Communion has tried to mend relations by asking the 38 provinces to make an Anglican covenant, but this has generally not been accepted. And now, in order to try to resolve conflict, the Communion has also adopted the custom of Ndaba, or small meetings of people who come together with opposing theological and cultural points of view, encouraged to speak together to each other in an atmosphere of respect. And this has produced very wonderful results because we find that Parts of the communion which are widely divided are now holding together because through these small meetings people become friends together and that friendship transcends theological and cultural differences. And this coming Saturday, as you see in the bulletin, there is a big meeting here in Auckland and on coming Sunday a service in Auckland Cathedral to for the beginning of a very important meeting of the entire Anglican Communion here in New Zealand of the Anglican Consultative Conference. And this is one of the three instruments of unity of the worldwide Anglican Communion meeting every two or three years. And this conference comprises women and men, 
priests as well as bishops, ordained as well as those who are not ordained. It's our hope that this conference, being here in New Zealand, may learn something from being here in the Church of New Zealand, Aotearoa, with its three tikanga of Pākehā, Māori and Polynesian, a church which really embraces unity in diversity. An example of the church in this land can surely encourage the whole Anglican communion, showing how our church holds together where there are different theological and cultural differences, bringing together people's own various gifts, and so make our communion a more effective witness for mission and service. I thank you for your own witness and service, and I end with the prayer which we have in our prayer book for the closing of every Eucharist. God Almighty, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out into the world by the power of the Holy Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. May God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.